جورج بليز انتروديوس يور سيلف هيك هيك انت طلعت لايف اوكي في انا مش فاهم معي بعد في حدا معنا صار اون لاين اي عم نبلش يصير اون لاين يس اوكي جورج خويري ليبانيز اي تي سندكت بريزيدنت وكمان سي سي اي وام اي وتيلي كوميونيكيشن يعني وي ار وي ار وركينج اول توجذر تو جوين ذا اي تي عم تسمعني؟ ايه اه سوري هلا المين كونسيرن تبعنا از تو اسيست ان ذا ديجيتال ترانسفورميشن اللي انت عم تعمل مجهود عليه رائع يا رودي يعطيك الف عافيه و وتراي تو سبورت ذا اي سي تي سيكتور ثانك يو جورج اي بدك تزيد شيء؟ لا كنت بتقول انه عم نجرب نوحد القطاع كلنا يد وحده لنتقدم سوا يس 100% Miguel Gonzalez, hello. Could you introduce yourself? Yes, this is Miguel from Monterrey, Mexico. I'm. My position is IT audit and IT risk manager, and I work for a private university in 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 Mexico. Nice to meet you guys. Thank you. I have somebody by the name of Samiri. Could you please introduce yourself or rename yourself? I'm sorry, I should have talked in English, Rudy. I'm sorry. No problem, no problem. Okay. Um, uh, Khalil Rasi, can you introduce yourself, please? Hi, everyone. This is Khalil Rasi. I'm uh, uh, a computer engineer uh, by study and also a strategist also by study. So uh, I do freelance consultancies in uh, strategy, business development around digital transformation and technologies. Thank you, Khalil. Um, Hamad, uh, I'm not sure I'm going to Hi, Mohamed. Hello, everyone. I'm Mohamed Al Bahsali. Hello, Mr. Mohamed. I'm a freelance developer in the domain of software and in the domain of e-learning. I'm a graduate from the American University of Beirut in Beirut three years ago. Recently, I moved to the world of freelancing after I was working in the corporate life. So far, so good, Yanu. Thank you, Lalak. Nader Ghazal. Hi, Nader. Okay. Natalie Yunan, can you please introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. Hi, Natalie. Hello. Hi, uh, Natalie Yunan. Uh, I'm the informatic de gestion by study. And I'm an experience and the managerial, uh, organizational managerial, yani the key process and processes for the companies. And now I'm the last seven years before in the operation management. Thank you. Uh, All right. No, I wanted to say that uh, I'm part of the committee of the digital transformation and, uh, ah, that we, okay. Are, okay. we will be doing tomorrow. Okay. So uh, we'll meet you tomorrow. Faisal. Glad to hear from you. Yes. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Thank you. Uh, George. Bu... Yes. George Abud. Ah, sorry. Sorry. Hello, everybody. Uh, Hi. Good to be on your meeting with you. I'm uh, with IPG Photonics. I'm responsible for the telecom business for IPG Photonics. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, can I uh, speak now? Uh, yes. Please go. Well, okay. Uh, I'm Nader, well, I'm Nader, Dr. Nader Ghazal. I have a PhD in artificial intelligence since 1991. 
and I received at that time uh, the National Research Distinction Award from the states. Uh, now I'm a university professor. I was at AUB till 19, uh, till 2015. I'm full timer in um, Lebanese University. At the same time, I have my company in digital transformation, digital te technologies uh, on the uh, min in the MENA region. Okay, thank you. Let me. Who else we can take? Alain, could you introduce yourself, please? Hello, <clears throat> excuse me. Hello, everyone. Uh, sorry to be late to the meeting. Um, I work in cybersecurity and uh, digital transformation, uh, especially with um, uh, IT and telecom companies. Uh, I'm currently based in Saudi Arabia, and um, I uh, I work with a you know um, a managed security services uh, company. I've been um, in this domain uh, for a bit over 20 years, so um, I'd like to expand the network. Um, I see some new faces here. I'm happy to listen to what you have to say about um, 5G digital transformation, and of course AI because this is the the next step and and everything i think around us not not just in digital transformation in our daily lives in our cybersecurity, and it um everywhere so these are really really good topics uh interesting topics to listen to and i'm looking forward to um hearing uh, from the experience from the experts that are on this panel thank you thank you Alain. i'll take the last one uh mr haysam shibli Hello, my name is Haisnam Shibli. I'm a network quality manager at uh, Touch Lebanon. Uh, I'm looking forward to hear about uh, digital transformation ideas that you're going to present. Thank you, Haisam. I'm going to take one more, which is uh, Jairani Bung Bungsi. Hi, Jairani. Hello. Okay, so let's start. Okay, I'll do a little bit uh, housekeeping before we start. I want to thank you for coming today and uh, being part of uh, another series of uh, digital transformation talk. Uh, please mute your microphone at all time. Uh, you can ask any related uh, question in the chat box and anyone, anytime you want to speak, please raise your hand and basically you will be asked to speak. Uh, we will dedicate the part, the more part on the question and answers towards the end. There will be a poll running. If I did not introduce it, please do answer it and we'll be sharing the uh, answers back. There will be a feedback survey in the end. Please do fill it so we know we can, how we can enhance, how we can uh, uh, do things better for uh, next time. And uh, this session will be recorded and streamed to YouTube live. So if you need uh, the links, it will be published over uh, later on uh, over the social media and an email will be, uh, you'll be receiving an email also about this. So let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Rudy Shushani. I am uh, specialized in ICT governance, policies, cybersecurity, and digital transformation. I have 22 years, around 22 years in uh, technology field. So uh, um, my background is diverse on this topic. I'm certified from many different institutions. I have div many different university degrees on the topics also. And uh, so before we start, uh, I would like to uh, introduce a little bit the speakers and then uh, we'll go on. Each speaker will introduce himself. So we have George Ailey today from uh, Cleos, he's the CEO and founder of uh, Cleos. We have Sherbil Dieb, regional director of OneSpan, Middle East, Africa, Turkey, and Central Asia and Pakistan. And we have also uh, Sherbil Gostin, our uh, a co founder at Blockchain Leaders, advisor, trainer, entrepreneur, and university uh, lecturer. What I forgot to say uh, about George Ailey, sorry, I did not read it which is he's also an entrepreneur and an innovator. And we'll see uh, what does an innovator actually do and what is innovation. So I will start by George. George, could you please introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is George Alaili. I'm a co-founder and CEO of Cleos. 
you know, Cleos uh, is a company that uh, designs and manufactures 4G plus and 5G platforms. Uh, we have been one of the leading companies to work on uh, IP radio and end-to-end uh, -end mobile IP platforms. Uh, uh, we, uh, we are currently uh, focusing on creating an optimal uh, 5G or an optimized 5G platform that uh, takes into consideration 5G safety and uh, basically uh, with advanced features uh, rather than just uh, pushing the envelope. So uh, our field is 5G. Personally, I'm uh, specialized in uh, radio. Uh, I'm a radio engineer, and uh, I'm glad to be on the panel today. Thank you, George. Sherbel uh, Diab, please introduce yourself. Thank you, Rudy, and good evening, everyone. So I'm Sherbel Diab, uh, Lebanese, and living in Dubai for the past 14 years. I work for an American cybersecurity uh, company named OneSpan. Uh, for the guys who are in the cybersecurity uh, industry, they might be knowing us uh, as Vasco. We changed the name of the company. I'm the managing director for the Metap region. Uh, our solutions mainly are focused for the banking sector when it comes to strong authentication and security, as well as fraud management, digital onboarding, and electronic signature, which crosses uh, across or span across different industries eventually. Thank you, uh, Sherbil. Uh, Sherbil Gustin, please introduce yourself. Thank you, Rudy. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Sherbil Gustin, co founder of uh, Blockchain Leaders. We are a, a consulting uh, company. We are based in Beirut uh, and serving the whole MENA region. Uh, beside consulting, blockchain leaders is into research and development. Uh, we partner with the University of Quebec in Canada uh, to develop uh, new blockchain products. Uh, we are also uh, focusing, uh, highly focusing uh, on trainings. Uh, we deliver uh, training uh, in, for blockchain, uh, digital transformation and uh, fintech through uh, major academies and partners uh, in the whole uh, region also. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to be with you uh, all tonight to discuss uh, strategies of digital transformation. Uh, so thank you for attending. Thank you, Sherbil. All right. So we'll start. Uh, just let me remind you, if you have any question while we're moving, please uh, put them in the chat box and uh, we'll take them while we go and in the end. Uh, let me start by the first question. Digital transformation is driven by a simple uh, desire to make work better for everyone, employees and customers, to give them services, to give them better experiences and so on. A crucial part of digital transformation is understanding what technology can help a business achieve. So what do you think today, the technology part of it, can help achieve in the digital transformation. Sherbil Austin, could you start with, uh, do you mind? Uh, yes, uh, effectively, uh, the lack of trust between uh, the multiple uh, stakeholders in any uh, business or sector, or even between government and uh, people uh, is the most, uh, let's say, problem that we face every day. So uh, whenever you are doing business with someone you don't know, so uh, establishing this trust is, is a major issue. Uh, uh, also in case of uh, uh, dealing with ministries and we know what, what, uh, what's happening in Lebanon in terms of fraud and corruption and all that. Uh, in, in, uh, in our application regarding blockchain, blockchain is known as a trust protocol. So. Uh, this technology will help to uh, enable the trust between unknown peers, uh, people that don't trust uh, each other, or even entities they don't know and don't trust each other. So uh, the, main, the main function that this technology can add for any ecosystem, for any business, for any, uh, let's say, a nation, it's uh, the, the fact that it enables a trust easily by the protocol. The trust is not... Uh, between the system and the, the users or 
between a server or an entity, it's between the group itself. So this is one of the major advantages that this kind of technology can, can provide in terms of uh, enabling digital transformation and shifting toward uh, a digital uh, world, or a digital uh, network, or a digital nation. Thank you, uh, Sherbel. I'll, I'll, answer, I'll ask the same question to Sherbel Diab and later on to George, just to set a base about the technology part and the digital transformation. Please go ahead, Sherbel. Uh, sure, Rudy. So I can second as well my colleague, Sherbel Rostin. Uh, when we talk about digital transformation, it has different aspects depending on the industry that we're talking about. If I take an example, let's say the government sector. Uh, indeed, when we talk about the government sector today, the citizens are coming or becoming more as clients and customers to the government sector. In all the countries, citizens are taxpayers eventually. So you are paying for the service that you are getting. Today, transparency is one of the biggest pillars when it comes to digital transformation. Transparency, the speed, the cost, and the customer experience. When you have uh, solutions in place and technology in place, eventually you are minimizing the corruption that Sheldon talked about, and this is really important. I've been in this domain for the past 12 years when it comes to electronic government, and uh, the corruption and transparency was one of the biggest pillars that every government is looking for to achieve. Uh, today, in this era of technology as well, we are looking for the speed and the processes. If you take, let's say, an industry like the banking sector, which I'm specialized in, today all the banks they are looking to absorb more customers and to minimize the churn in order to, as well, uh, provide more services, uh, faster services and wider services. Uh, today in the pandemic, we're all seeing that the processes or the industries got disrupted a little bit. So banks are shutting down some branches, but as well, they are turning into digital uh, channels. So today, I want as a customer to do to apply for any transaction, to open maybe an account, uh, to sign a document or a contract from anywhere, from any device at any time. Today, digital transformation is playing a very pivotal role in technology and uh, economy uh, at the government level or any private enterprise. Thank you, Sherbel. Uh, George, from your side of uh, the quadrum. Yes. Basically, uh, by definition, like digital transformation is the process of using digital technologies to create new uh, business processes or even modify existing ones uh, to create new cultures uh, and customer experiences and to me, changing uh, business and market requirements. Uh, from our end, we focus on the physical uh, or wireless access, on the radio access part, and this is as well one of the main enablers that uh, provides uh, the ability to have a digital transformation, because if you don't have the access technology, you will not be able to implement any uh, application. So from our side of things, we try to uh, advance uh, our uh, radio access network and provide uh, networks that can provide higher capacity, lower uh, latency, uh, more reliability, higher security, and what have you in terms of network uh, functionalities and characteristics always in the aim of providing a better user experience, more applications and more, if I may say, more uh, personalization uh, of uh, the communication infrastructure. Thank you. Uh, okay, let me run a poll meanwhile. Uh, okay, there we go. So, uh, this is a poll. Do you think implementing technology would make successful digital transformation? Just want to give it a couple of more seconds and then we'll, uh, we'll continue. Okay. 
Okay, five, four, three, two, and one. Let me share the results. So the answer is the majority, around the majority uh, say yes, okay? And uh, very interesting. And then we'll see later on why uh, technology is a, is a major part, but we'll discuss more why technology alone is not the main uh, pillar in the uh, digital transformation. And then we'll uh, go into this. It's a main part for me. Uh, it's a major part actually, but it's not the winner and or the loser uh, part. Okay, so my second question is about organization leadership. Is organization leadership needed? The changes to organization leadership needed in today's digital transformation and in the industrial world or 4.0 and all of these blockchains, uh, AI and IOTs, is the, is the normal boards able to deliver and are they aware of such technologies? Can they actually uh, transport this organization or organizations in general to a better place? George, what do you think about this uh, question on the leadership side? Definitely, uh, having uh, these technologies will eventually propel a particular business to a better place. Uh, whether the question is how far you can go, how optimally you can use this technology to, uh, to go to a higher place. Uh, but having these processes in place definitely uh, will give you a better positioning. Uh, the more the management of a particular company is familiar, uh, the more uh, they go into uh, these without, uh, without making it too complex, without complexi uh, complexifying it and rendering uh, their life uh, difficult, the better uh, they can be. Uh, in particular, in manufacturing, it's becoming more and more vital to go into uh, a certain form of digital transformation as it has lots of advantages and lots of cost cutting. So it depends on the industry, uh, the vitality of using uh, digital transformation or, or undergoing digital transformation uh, uh, is, uh, is uh, like, depends how, how uh, vital it is, but uh, definitely any form of digital transformation will enhance the business. Thank you, thank you, George. Sherbil uh, Diab, I'll ask you the same on the banking sector. Uh, with uh, one span has been there for a while. You've been with the company for a while. You have many projects. Why do projects actually fail in the digital transformation part? Very good question. So it's basically it's uh, related to the vision and to the expectations. Uh, again, today, uh, every company, they want to have something that's really fast uh, because they want to go with services to the market and uh, go to market in a really fast way. Uh, this is driven actually by the pressure that has been put by the customers themselves. If today we are talking about banks, the customers, they are demanding. I need to have services today. I need to open an account through my mobile phone. I need to do a transfer, uh, I need to pay my uh, water bill, my electricity bill, my phone bill, I need to pay maybe my school fees through the mobile phone. Not all of the banks today in the region and maybe as well worldwide are offering such services and this is putting a lot of pressure on the sponsors uh, within the organizations or the banks. So uh, the vision is known, I need to give and provide services in time, but the expectations that are really high and some other aspects within the implementation that are not taken care of, especially when it comes to the security, would make a project fail. Today, you have to balance between the customer experience and the security. If you see within the pandemic, the rate of attacks and hacks that are happening today in the banking sector are tremendous. And this is a big question mark that we need to ask ourselves. Uh, are we taking the security in a proper measurement level and scale or all what we care about is just the customer experience? So balancing between both aspects and pillars, I believe would lead into success. Thank you, uh, Sherbil. 
Uh, Sharb al I'll ask you the question in a little bit different. Uh, usually when you approach, when a customer approach you, he understands blockchain. And blockchain is somehow a new term that has been there for the last possibly 20, 12 years now. But when a customer approaches you, that means he understands or he wants or he is willing to change. But what would you do when you go to customers pitching about blockchain and the management actually uh, uh, directly connect you to Bitcoin? Ah, Bitcoin is a fraud. <laughs> Would you mind sharing? Yes, uh, if effectively uh, what you said about uh, the combination between Bitcoin and blockchain is our uh, normal life when uh, when approaching customers. So uh, we are facing two, two or mainly three types of customers. The first one that don't, they don't have any clue about blockchain as technology. So that's why we, we focus on uh, awareness and knowledge transfer when it comes to blockchain. Uh, second type of customer that they uh, heard, uh, they're hearing about blockchain as a emerging technology and they want to invest or to introduce blockchain in their system. Uh, I'll give an example. We were uh, approached from a uh, company in, in an Arab country, an IT company, mainly a major holding. Uh, they want us to, to partner with them on, on the blockchain services. They don't know about blockchain, so they asked uh, can you provide us with some use cases for blockchain so we can sell to our uh, clients? Uh, I refuse directly because it's not a, a box or a black box or product that you can sell. Our approach is totally different. You have to provide the awareness for the client, train him so he, he will know what is a blockchain if, uh, effectively and he will uh, make the use cases within his system. So whenever you, you highlight the, uh, the features of blockchain, the advantages of blockchain, directly uh, the client and their team, the IT team, or uh, whenever even the legal teams in, in some cases, they will highlight the use cases based on their problem uh, that are, uh, they are facing uh, in their uh, legacy systems. So uh, yes, blockchain is a new term in terms of uh, 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 or uh, compared to other uh, emerging technologies, but uh, the approach must be uh, in a uh, uh, educational, uh, let's say, uh, uh, form first, then the business will come later on. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think we lost uh, George. Technology. I'm back. No <laughs> oh, you're back. Okay, uh, George, question. Uh, you are an innovator. Can I say that? You, well, well you, when you sent me your bio, it said innovation. And I know you do innovation. Do you mind sharing what, does, what, what is innovation first and how does it help uh, in today's world? And what do you actually innovate in? Uh, innovation basically is finding what uh, a particular uh, need is available where there's a need in a certain area and uh, there are no solutions around it and finding a solution to solve a particular problem. Uh, we are focused on uh, radio access networks. We design 4G plus and 5G platforms. So our main field of expertise is basically uh, radio access networks. So radio technology, how to have a better uh, spectral efficiency, how to uh, have a smarter network, how to be able to mitigate interference, and how to have uh, really uh, solutions that uh, render communication more of, a, of an ad hoc thing. So uh, as you know, the evolution has been from 1G to 2G to 3G, 4G, and 5G. And the more we go into uh, advanced form of communication, the more the communication is becoming personalized and uh, the more features you can implement, the more applications you can do. With 5G, with 4G, with 5G, we are able to do applications that we were not able to do with previous technologies. So our innovation revolves around, particularly in what we do, in, in terms of how we can uh, reduce, for example, the noise level or mitigate the interference and enhance the signal to noise ratio to be able to have a smaller number of base stations to cover 
to provide a given capacity or to cover a certain geographical area. So it's just an optimization uh, of the network and provisioning of higher capacity and a better service. Okay, so having less, uh, I would say, repeaters or I don't know the, the word, you, yes, base stations, actually will cost less. Yes, basically, you, 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 you so will. This is kind of innovation in the, in the way it works. And yes, you have to see it from various points of view. From a point of view of an operator, you have a lower operational expense. So they need to rent a smaller number of towers, they need to uh, have a smaller number of engineers to service it. Uh, in smaller number of points uh, that can be uh, breached in terms of security. You need a lower power to, uh, uh, to run it because uh, you have a smaller number of points. Uh, from, uh, from a pollution point of view, uh, from a visual pollution point of view, you have less number of towers. Uh, you have a cleaner network and uh, basically uh, you have a uh, uh, you are able to uh, uh, find uh, better places, uh, especially in urban areas. Uh, in CBDs, it's extremely hard now to be able to find places where to put antennas. From, okay. a, uh, from a radio spectrum perspective, it's a cleaner, uh, it's a cleaner uh, uh, usage of the spectrum. So basically, you do not occupy large bands of the spectrum. All right. And I'll ask this question to all three of you. What are the emerging technologies today based on where you are? What's happening? The IOTs, the, the speed of the internet, what new things are today are turning around? If you, George, if you may start with the IOTs and whatever uh, technologies are going on there. Uh, the way it's going, you have advances in every uh, for in each of these technologies. For the digital transformation in particular, you have eight pillars uh, of the technology. You have, of course, the radio access network, which is 5G. You have IoT, Internet of Things, which goes hand in hand with 5G. You have uh, digital twin, where you create uh, basically a digital avatar for whatever you're doing and you conduct all the testing and simulation before. You have augmented reality, which is playing as well uh, a significant role. Uh, you have cloud computing. Cloud computing has a very important role as well. It's the core of whatever uh, is happening as computational processes become uh, more and more of a, uh, of a need. You've got robotics and you have additive manufacturing. So in each of these, uh, in each of these technologies, you have the teams, you have the specialists that are working around the clock to make sure that they are at the edge. And there are amazing innovations taking place in each of these fields. Thank you, George. Uh, Sharbil, on the side of the blockchain and whatever you are doing, what are the latest innovations and emerging trends? Uh, well, uh, let me just add one point to what George was uh, mentioning. Uh, the current challenge is uh, in digital transformation is to to provide a, a bundle of the whole these these technologies and to to make use of uh, multiple technologies in in each application. So, for example, you can use a blockchain to secure uh, IoT devices. This is one of the examples, and you can introduce. Uh, blockchain and artificial intelligence in, in a given scenario. So the challenge is to make use uh, of the maximum of these uh, these uh, emerging technologies. Uh, in terms of innovations, when it comes to to blockchain, uh, we are uh, we saw during the pandemic uh, the uh, the problem of uh, cash and uh, people shifting from cash to, uh, to digital money, to mobile uh, banking solutions, as Sherbil was mentioning. And uh, currently, there's a huge uh, focus worldwide from central banks on providing uh, the central bank digital currencies. So the digital currency uh, for each central bank that will release uh, its uh, paper money or the, the current fiat currencies. So. Uh, Based on the la last uh, report from the Bank of International Settlement, the BIS, 70% of the central banks worldwide are currently investing uh, the CDBC's projects 
from a research to pilot projects. Uh, and we know that uh, the People Bank of China, the Central Bank of China, is uh, quiet uh, uh, in a in couple of months. He will launch the E1 and the public, uh, let's say, employees, the public sector employees will get their uh, wages based on uh, e-wallet on a uh, central bank digital currency. Also, we, we have some tests uh, in, uh, with uh, Societe Generale and the Central Bank of France on the digital euro. Uh, the project was supported by the ECB also. Uh, major banks from Bank of England, Bank of Canada uh, are doing this project. So in terms of banking and money, this is currently the innovation. Uh, there's uh, some innovations in multiple sectors. Uh, for example, we in blockchain leaders, we focus on the energy sector and its relation to blockchain. Uh, we launched a paper a couple of uh, months ago uh, on what we call energy performance contracting. It's a new way to approach energy performance using blockchain. Once uh, a project contains multiple stakeholders from an energy service company uh, or a client and a, a financial company that lends money for a given project. Uh, currently, uh, we are doing a pilot project in Dubai with one of the major ESCOs there to, to have the proof of concept. So uh, it's, it's, uh, you can find innovation in multiple sectors uh, based on what, what are you looking for. Thank you, uh, Sherbin. Sherbin, yeah, also I'll take this question for you with whatever happening in your, in one span. I'm sure there's a lot of innovation and uh, emerging trends also happening there. And then you're in the coping and following, possibly even innovating on this front. Indeed, indeed. So uh, in the banking sector in general, there are two major aspects that are driving the innovation today. The first aspect eventually is what we call the financial inclusion. Uh, many of the central banks are driving financial inclusion strategies because many of the populations are not yet banked. They don't have accounts in the bank. They are still keeping cash money. If you go to Egypt, for example, it's a country for more than 100 million uh, in the population. Barely 20% of the Egyptian population is banked. And this is a big challenge today for uh, the Central Bank of Egypt because they want to convince the citizens to open accounts, uh, to change the mentality and to bring more education to include them within the financial system. So this first aspect, as one span, we solve it through digital onboarding solutions. Again, I can open an account by sitting at home through my mobile phone, through my computer or through my tablet. Uh, I can upload all the documents. They can be verified in the background. Uh, I can create my account, so on and so forth. The other aspect in, in this innovation spectrum is the regulatory compliance. And this is the biggest challenge for the banks. Today, all the central banks are putting in place very rigid regulatory frameworks, especially when it comes to the cybersecurity and digital channels that the banks need to comply with. And today here where one span can help the banks, whether it is from strong authentication and security, securing the digital channels, securing the entire journey of the customer within the life cycle within, within the bank. And on top of that, and this is the major part when it comes to machine learning and real time fraud monitoring. And this is what we are specialized in. Today, you cannot offer digital services without taking into consideration having a proper uh, fraud monitoring system in real time that's monitoring across all the channels. And I'll give you an example, if you allow me, Rudy, in this space, for mm -hmm. everybody to understand how the things would go in the background, especially from the banking uh, system. Uh, today, I am Charbel. I'm used to do transactions through my laptop, which is Lenovo running Windows as operating system. I do the transactions for known beneficiaries and for a known amount, let's say $1,000 at max. And I do the transaction from Dubai for people within the UAE and within a known time range. All of this information is known for the bank. Out of a sudden, the same user, the same client, Sharbin, is doing a transaction from a MacBook at 3 a.m 
from Beijing and China to a new beneficiary and for a $10,000 value. It could be two things. It could be an attack. It could be a hacking approach. And my account has been taken over by a hacker. Or it could be what we call a false positive, which could be in reality that in, indeed Sharmil is in China. He didn't take his Lenovo laptop with him. He's using the business center from the hotel, which is using a MacBook. He's doing a new trading deal. He met a new trader. He created his beneficiary as account and he's sending him or transferring to him a big amount of money. And here the bank has to take a proper decision whether to stop this transaction or to challenge the fact to know if this is really my customer or not. So these are the biggest spectrums of innovation that driving the technology within the banking sector today and that one span can support the banking industry with. Perfect example, uh, Sherbel, and I thank you for that. I have a question from Elsie. What are the main risks and difficulties and at attentions point that you're facing? And what are the measures of attenuation you are following? Example, uh, security-wise, cloud versus physical, and many others. Can anybody take this question? I can help on this, as this is my area of expertise. And since yes. Elsie is a very old friend, it's been <laughs> ages I didn't see her. Hi, Elsie, first. Uh, definitely all what you've mentioned, all what you have mentioned are within the core of the problems today within the banking sector. So always there is the decision, cloud on premise. Uh, and I guarantee you from now to the coming four or five years, you won't see any technology vendor selling on-premise solutions anymore. Everybody is driving a cloud-only methodology or strategy. A couple of years ago, we started with cloud first and on-premise second. Today, most of the vendors that are going into a cloud-only strategy. Why? Because deployment would be faster. The cost for the banks or any type of organization who want to adopt cloud solutions would be cheaper as a cost. Uh, time to go to market is faster and the high availability is there and it is secure. So eventually the education when it comes to cloud versus on-premise is a big of problem. But not only this, it's not about the education wise, it's as well the regulatory framework because if you look into the Middle East, many of the countries, they do not allow cloud computing or cloud uh, technologies. The major reason is they don't want the data to get out of the premises or out of the borders of the country. Uh, that's all related to warfare and to the cyber security. But things are changing and uh, frameworks are put in place. Today, Amazon opened their data center in Bahrain. Microsoft Azure opened their data center in the UAE. And we are hearing as well that the Central Bank of Egypt is building a big hosting uh, data center in Egypt for the coming five years for the banking sector. So things are moving, things are changing eventually. When it comes to the security, this is what I always emphasize on. The banking sector should take into consideration security. If you want to offer services to the customers, always look into the security. Security is not a burden. It's not about challenging the customer experience. Eventually it is how you monitor the customer experience and offer better uh, non-disrupted experience to the customer. So yes, security, cloud computing are the biggest problems that I might uh, witness today within the banking industry. Does anybody wants to add something to yes, the... Yes, uh, I, I want to add uh, something uh, related to the question of uh, Elsie. Uh, our approach from the blockchain level is different than uh, Sherbil approach in terms of uh, security and protection when it comes to banking and transactions mainly. Because uh, from the core of uh, blockchain, it's secure, it's decentralized, we don't have the centralization part, we don't have the server part, uh, the single point of failure does not exist in, in blockchain. So uh, uh, aside, we, we have uh, higher cryptocurrencies, 
sorry, higher uh, cryptography uh, on on users, on addresses, on keys, private and public keys using asymmetric cryptography. So uh, it's not a difficulty uh, once uh, you are approaching the, the challenges from the blockchain side of you. Uh, mainly uh, the regulation and what Sherbil mentioned and uh, uh, applying these regulations in, in the banking sector, for example, uh, is the main challenge uh, for us in terms of uh, applying this kind of new technologies. Uh, so uh, this is mainly what, what we are facing in terms of uh, uh, difficulties, in terms of uh, uh, blockchain uh, approaches. Should we answer the second question or not yet? You can, because uh, I think uh, I wanted to ask it for you. I wanted to ask you this question. Yeah. Uh, regarding Which is open, uh, your open opinion banking. about, yes, open banking. We are open seeing uh, recently a lot of uh, open banks or uh, banks, online banks without branches from Monzo to Revolt and it's, uh, it's trendy. Uh, what, I, what can I say is that uh, uh, banks should uh, change the way that are uh, dealing with uh, with customers. So bank cannot deal with me like it was dealing with my father like 30, 30 years ago. And for sure, uh, not like he will deal with my uh, children in 10 years. So uh, banks should adopt to these uh, needs. And Sherbil was mentioning that there's always uh, demands we need to do every services on all the services while sitting home. So uh, especially the, the, the growth and the youth with their mobile phones, they, they want to, to be able to do everything uh, just sitting or using their mobiles. So uh, open banking is, is here and will stay. Uh, it's not the, the new norm for banking. Uh, big banks and commercial banks will stay but uh, with the uh, with the publishing of the central banks uh, and the digital currencies the open bank will be like um, a new a new way of of banking uh, and it will stay for it's it's my opinion in this uh, regard thank you Sherbel. i'll be launching uh, the second uh, poll Uh, meanwhile, all right. And while uh, sharing the poll, I'll ask uh, George about what digital transformation strategies today companies should start thinking of. Uh, it depends on uh, their area of uh, their fields. Uh, for example, if you go to manufacturing, uh, it's it's vital to start implementing IoT, Internet of Things, uh, a little bit of artificial intelligence. But uh, as Shadow previously said, a combination of these technologies should be implemented uh, in, a, in a balanced way to be able to provide the best available solutions. Definitely, uh, you would need to be uh, in an ecosystem where we have a proper uh, telecom infrastructure uh, to be able to support whatever you do. In case you are doing uh, this uh, on an on-site basis, to have a proper uh, on-site communication platform implemented, and whether and if you are doing it on a country, uh, countrywide, on a country level, you would need to have a proper infrastructure. Let it be from a fiber point of view, or from a 4G plus 5G uh, or mobile uh, point of view. So uh, for manufacturing, this is. Uh, important for uh, services i would say augmented reality is important uh, for every field you have a one of these pillars that uh, can play a vital role to propel a particular uh, business thank you i will end the poll now uh, and thank you george um, 83 percent said yes to the poll do you think leadership change should change to adopt a successful uh, digital transformation and this is a vital uh, question and I will share a small slide about uh, digital transformation. A digital transformation talks about three different pillars. One of them, this is what I uh, 
said before, one of them is technology, but the other one is culture. And for me, the most important, one of the most important is uh, the strategy. If the strategy is not there, if you just deploy the technology, I think the project will fail. If the culture is there, but the strategy and the technology is not there, also the project will be facing some problems. The combination of these three will make possibly the biggest success and actually deliver services that people actually want. Taking the example of Estonia, which we hosted a couple of weeks back, uh, I think their model of digital transformation is beautiful. The way they have uh, drafted the governance of it and the way uh, their leadership changed. They came after a big war and uh, they had nothing. So they decided they start from zero and they did their leadership and the leadership actually, most of them is young. So this is a very crucial element. And hopefully today in Lebanon, we can learn from this. We went to Estonia to actually learn. There was a parliamentary uh, uh, delegate uh, went there and they saw the model of Estonia. But uh, with all what's happening in Lebanon, hopefully today and tomorrow soon, uh, we'll have something that we can start actually implementing using this digital transformation for the citizens purposes to help the citizens uh, transform Lebanon to a knowledge economy where we can help and everybody can help achieve uh, hopefully a better uh, Lebanon. So I'll stop the sharing of this and uh, we'll proceed uh, with our uh, format. And uh, from strategic perspective, Sherbel Dieb, what, what do you think you can add on the strategies that uh, people or uh, companies and CEOs or board members should actually start taking? Uh, I will talk about something that many of us, I believe from the attendees would relate to. Today, most of us are not working from our offices. We are working from home. Uh, and eventually this is an element that increased uh, the security aspect. So uh, first, strategy that each organization, whatever the industry is, that should look into is securing remote access. Uh, today, uh, static passwords is no longer the trend. So just memorizing a password uh, is no longer the trend in order to access an application. Many of us, and I believe many of you would relate that the passwords would be your birthday or your uh, wife's name or your pet's name so on and so forth. Uh, today, the, the main aspect of changing the security, uh, whether it is a banking sector, government, uh, any conglomerate, enterprise, so on and so forth, is by adopting strong authentication. The strong authentication comes from three different pillars. It's about something you know, it's about something you have, and it's about something you are. Something you are is your biometrics. And this is driving technology big time, like your fingerprint, like your face, like your iris, like your voice. Uh, these are very specific to the individual. So today you can access your home by just scanning your face. If you have an access control system, you can log into your mobile banking application by just scanning your fingerprint or your face or your voice. Uh, so securing the applications is really, really important. But as well, I need to second you in your slide, Rudy. Vision and culture are really important. From our uh, interaction with different uh, companies and organizations, uh, today the culture is playing the biggest vital role. If the employees, as well as the management of the organizations are not willing to adopt technology, they will fail. Definitely they will go into a failure. Uh, today, employees, they want the business as usual. They want to stay in their comfort zone. So if you want to bring a new change to them, if you want to implement a new technology, a new process, a new procedure, you will face the rejection. So changing the culture on its own is really important in the digital transformation journey. Otherwise, definitely the failure is uh, the, the target. Thank you, uh, Sherwin. Uh, George, question. You started and you are an innovator and you started innovating. How did this came out? How 
today we have Cleos playing in the 5G field and other uh, fields. How did this innovation uh, bring uh, George and Cleos company to today? How, how does it compete? Uh, what, what happened in this creation of this ideas for Cleos to be here today? Well, you start looking at what's available and you identify certain points uh, that you can possibly do better. Uh, and uh, you get an idea and then you chase it. It's not easy, but if you're persistent enough, you can get to it. Uh, we are a team uh, of highly specialized people, each in our field, each in his field. Uh, for example, I'm deep in radio engineering, uh, mathematics. I've got my partners that are very deep as well in mathematics uh, on the IP side. So uh, when, we, when we started back then, it was in Sydney in 2002, uh, we, we identified uh, or we wanted to chase the idea of IP uh, becoming a, uh, IP switching becoming a pervasive commodity like uh, electricity, uh, like water, like anything. And from there onwards, we went towards developing a system that provides you with uh, IP access, with a, uh, with a solid, full end-to-end -end IP access wherever you are, even when on the move. Uh, back, back then, uh, it was in 2002 or 2003, we were driving across the Harbor Bridge uh, with two megabit per second downward. It was really uh, something really advanced back then. Uh, you had 128 kilobit per second, and if you moved it left and right, it would stop. So um, we knew we had something that's working and we, we pushed it through till we got to, uh, uh, to the LTE when LTE became a standard. So we moved into uh, the standardization and we, we shifted our platform to become 100% uh, 3GPP ratified. And now we have really a top-notch carrier grade uh, 4G plus platform. And we're, uh, we're as well on uh, on our way to have um, a very, very advanced 5G platform that takes into consideration as well the concerns of people in terms of safety and uh, health hazards. Uh, quick question. Do you think you can share how many patents you have? Uh, we do have certain patents, but most of the patents we do not register them because the minute we register them, uh, they can be easily taken and slightly twisted and then they become floating around. In our field, it's safer to, to retain them in your vault and just do what you do best and keep, keep going forward. The more you advance, the more protected you are. Okay, I get you. Uh, Sherbil, also, would you mind sharing your uh, success story? Uh, because I looked around in the, in the area and I looked for, especially for Lebanese people uh, in the blockchain field and uh, I didn't find until uh, uh, by mistake, uh, through a friend, uh, stumbled upon you. So, uh, <laughs> would you mind sharing your success story of this? I think it's a part of a big successful digital transformation journey that you're offering. Yes. Uh, effectively, uh, the journey started like uh, four years ago. I'm I'm from the research, and uh, I do research, uh, and I'm a university lecturer, as I mentioned. So, I'm following up the new technologies. Uh, so once uh, I, I had a research on blockchain and Bitcoin effectively, so it all started there and I invested a lot of uh, time and efforts and studies uh, on, on the blockchain. Uh, so uh, we started like uh, me and my co-founder on, on the idea of establishing this consulting firm and uh, investing in, in uh, as I said, in efforts and studies. Uh, currently, I'm a certified blockchain architect. Uh, I, I believe that uh, no, no more than the five or six uh, architects currently in the region. Uh, also, I'm, I invested on um, the sector of uh, cryptocurrency and, and the blockchain. So I studied with the University of Nicosia and Cyprus, uh, which is the first university providing uh, masters in, in blockchain and cryptocurrency. Uh, at the end, yes, the, the, the region, our region have lack for 
blockchain professionals. So uh, we we tackle this this market, and uh, thanks God, we we are among the the few uh, companies uh, dedicated to blockchain and uh, doing research, consulting, and training those three pillars uh, together. Thank you, Joe. Uh, thank you, Sherbel. I just shared the contacts of uh, the speakers and the panelists. And uh, George, I shared your uh, website. I don't know if you have actually uh, LinkedIn. Um, uh, I just want to ask one more question to Sharbel. And uh, sorry, I'm just admitting some people here. Uh, Sharbel Diab, what do you think today is the foundation of digital transformation? In my in my books, I think. It's the electronic and digital signature. Would you mind sharing more information about this? And then, am I right? 100%, this is uh, the biggest trend. So I'm noticing in the past 20 years, every five years, a big buzz comes up in the market. So today it is the electronic signature. Uh, and it's picking up big time because many countries, they are eventually regularizing electronic signature. Uh, lately, I'll give an example in Egypt, there was a law and a decree uh, since 2004 to formalize the electronic signature. And uh, last month, they have uh, issued a new addendum and amendment to that law uh, to eventually optimize it more and to, uh, to allow more services on the electronic signature. What do we mean by electronic signature for everyone to understand? Uh, today, when we are signing a contract, we sign it through a pen. This is what we call the wet signature. And once that contract is signed by pen, it is already authenticated that this person or these two parties or more parties eventually, they agreed on the terms and conditions of that specific contract or document. Uh, and eventually, if there is any conflict and you need to go to the court, you need to prove that this document has not been tampered. And that's really your signature. It's you who signed that contract and nothing has been amended after the signature. And here where the electronic signature uh, plays a vital role because the electronic signature is a legal framework. It is a legal framework that can confirm that these parties eventually signed a document electronically, maybe by just clicking a button, click and sign, or maybe using an electronic pad on which you sign like we do today on our mobile phones. This is one of the biggest examples. But the beauty of it, of electronic signature, it is really tampered proof, which means after signing the contract, you cannot go, especially from one span, you cannot go as a party and uh, admit that the contract has been changed after the signature. Why? Because there are visual audit trades that can ensure and assure that you have read that document that you have read that paragraph, that you have read that sentence and that moment and that date. And each page of the document is already sealed electronically. It is tamper proof, you cannot change it. And today, many countries, they are taking by the electronic signature as a legal proof in the court. If you want to sue someone, you can take an electronically signed document and you can take it to the court and it is considered as a proof. Uh, today, this year, uh, in the UAE because there was like an initiative from the government of the UAE to go into a new government uh, platform. So they need to digitize all the processes of the government sector. And they started big time on the electronic signature. Today, many of the contracts at the government level that are signed electronically. Uh, this year, it was the first year I signed uh, the rental or the tenancy contract of, of my office and one of the free zones, which is a uh, government authority, we signed it electronically. We are no longer signing it uh, as a wet paper. Uh, this is really important. Why? Again, it is a legal framework. It is binding all the parties who are signing. It's really faster. You can sign the document from anywhere. You can sign it from your mobile. You can sign it from, from your computer by receiving the document over email or opening it over a portal. This is really important. Uh, today we have thousands and thousands of customers around the world adopting electronic signature. We started seeing this picking up in the banking sector a lot. Uh, the government, they started with this approach many years ago. 
Uh, I remember when we started pitching electronic signature for the government sector, it was back in 2008, 2009. So we are talking about more than a decade now. Uh, today it's picking up more in the, uh, in the banking sector and we are seeing as well a big demand in enterprises uh, because again, due to the pandemic, so today we are living the new normal as we name it. The new normal is working remotely, working from everywhere and anywhere without any disruption and make the processes a flow in the cycle. Uh, thank you, uh, Sherwin. Uh, I just want to add to Sherwin that in Lebanon uh, in 2018, there was law 81 uh, over 2018 regarding the electronic signature. And then we actually hosted uh, also parliament member head of uh, the ICT committee, uh, MP uh, Jmail. Uh, and we discussed this and then how we can bring uh, e-government and digital transformation to the government and hopefully we have, we try to have more initiatives, but uh, with the current situation and everything happening, there's a lot of challenges. And then we discussed, uh, because we have something called Marasini uh, Tutbe'i, which is, uh, I think, the, not the laws, the, the way things work in intergovernmental. So it needs circulars, it needs a lot of implementation, how it will it be implemented. Uh, Central Bank also has to issue something related uh, to the banks. Uh, we're still, I think, uh, this law took around 18 years to, uh, to be produced. As I've heard last week, there's a, uh, they are preparing version uh, 1.2. Okay, so this is good. Uh, hopefully uh, they put a deadline within a month and I uh, will be having more information later on on this. So this is a very good information and hopefully this will drive uh, Lebanon uh, to a better digital uh, world. Now, I just wanna ask Sherbil uh, Gostin, uh, but before also, I just wanna uh, tell uh, if anybody has a question, soon we'll be taking live questions also. So if anybody has a question, please pop it in the chat. Uh, Sherbel, what do you think is the role of uh, education? Well, it's it's important in all levels. Uh, whenever it comes to uh, business sectors or uh, governmental sector, uh, education is a key for providing knowledge and uh, opening the doors for uh, smoother, let's say, uh, transformation or applying uh, any kind of uh, digital scenarios. So uh, without education, uh, people will, will stay in their uh, old version. They, they cannot upgrade to the new, uh, to the new world, to the new uh, technologies. So it's, it's a major uh, key in, in providing uh, uh, this, as I said, this transformation. Uh, for example, uh, we were uh, working uh, since May with the Minister of Education in Lebanon on applying uh, blockchain uh, certificates validation uh, process. Uh, using blockchain, you know, it's, uh, you can verify any uh, fraud certificate. And we, we had the scenario a couple of years ago uh, from multiple private universities in Lebanon. So uh, our first uh, our first approach to the minister was uh, the the education. So for sure, it's it's something new for them. You have to highlight the process of of the technology first. Then you can go with the process of uh, uh, applying and testing and providing services using using your technology. So again, it's it's a key for any uh, technology or any new technology. Thank you, uh, Sherbin. Uh, I like to take live questions. If anybody raise his hand, please, uh, so we can uh, unmute him and uh, take him live. I'm ready to take any question now. Do we have any volunteer? Elsie? Yes. I have Please. one more question. As you were talking about the electronic signature in Lebanon, do you have any idea if the open banking in Lebanon is contradict contradictory to, to the secrecy law in Lebanon or uh, is it 
uh, is there an exchange or it's one way uh, one way data it's one way data unfortunately but you do have uh, exceptions for that but open banking so far has not been discussed from what i know in in lebanon because uh, when you say open banking, it means that you have to open every single account uh, of yours inside the uh, a bank. And I'll go not just open banking, I'll go to the EU example, uh, which is the PSD2 payment uh, service directive, uh, which talks inside Europe. Okay, and this is even uh, very specific, but they are trying to make a network inside Europe so that everybody can use the internet from wherever, whatever bank, wherever, uh, whatever channels, and there's sandboxes in this. So in Lebanon, before you start, you have to have a sandbox. And the mentality of having a sandbox, at least with the central bank today, has not this has not been discussed. We're facing, I think, a lot of issues uh, with, uh, uh, with, the, with the central bank and our economy and uh, uh, it's not helping, you know, focusing on certain things, unfortunately. But yes, as Rabia can answer, PSD2, exactly. Yes. Uh, hopefully, this will be uh, helping us in the future to uh, connect our banking systems, our customers to wherever in the world so we can exchange financial data for, uh, for insurance, maybe, or for payments, or for even for payments. information. Yes, I, I hope so. But so far, I have not seen, maybe I'm wrong, I have not seen anybody talking about this uh, in the current state. But, you know, Lebanese banks has branches outside, okay? And I know many of them under the mandate of the European uh, uh, EBD, European Banking uh, Directive, all right, uh, that they have to implement PSD2. So yes. that branches will be by mandate, they have to do it, but the Lebanese people will not be benefiting because their accounts are not there. Uh, I have another question and thank you, uh, Elsie, yeah. again, from Muhammad. Uh, Muhammad, would you like to ask it yourself? Uh, yes, I would like to ask you, uh... If anyone is uh, well versed in the software industry, especially software design, software architecture, uh, solutions architecture, uh, any new stuff in this uh, domain, any breakthroughs, uh, what about uh, virtualization, uh, etc.? cetera? Uh, Rostin, would you mind uh, answering this? Uh, it's not typically uh, my uh, my field of knowledge, but uh, in terms of uh, uh, architecture and design, I can answer once it's related to blockchain uh, uh, blockchain cases. And I think we have uh, um, our friend Sandeep Kumar attending. Uh, he he might have the the right answer. Sandeep, can you hear us? You're using a friend. <laughs> One million dollar question. <laughs> hi, Sandeep. Oh, hi, Hello, Sandeep. Hi, uh, can, can, can you hear the question properly? Can I? Uh, can uh, I get the question? Sure, sure. Uh, what about software design and software architecture? Any breakthroughs? Any new uh, emerging technologies there? Uh, actually, in in software design architecture, there are. Plenty of design has happened. As of now, the, the, the main important aspect is going on is called microservice architecture. So in the microservice architecture, what we do, we create the variety of different uh, live components of the, of the projects. So if one component gets down, other component will not get affected. So they themselves become the one uh, you know, common use case of the systems. So uh, in this in this uh, particular area, uh, you know we, we see uh, a tremendous uh, uh, change has happened. Also, as we are talking about the blockchain technology that Shabul was talking about, in the blockchain technology area, we needs to have a multi-node systems where we have to you know deploy uh, multi-tenant uh, architecture or all those software systems where there it becomes very important our software should be in a uh, you know microservice uh, architecture form to ensure that it never gets you know uh, if any problem happens if i need to update one particular version 
other version or other model should not get affected so i see those latest design technology is being used almost in maximum soft software areas uh, thank, thank you, you sandeep. sandeep thank you sandeep and rabia kanan shared something called stackshare.io which uh, talks uh, shares a lot of stacks uh, softwares and whatever so you can also uh, follow thank you rabia for that uh, uh, george just, just want to ask you one final uh, question before we start taking more questions and then we we, we conclude uh, what's next for uh, the 5g uh, well, for the 5G, it's uh, again uh, trying to get closer and closer to the Shannon limit and uh, to hopefully one day even break it. And uh, just higher spectral efficiency, lower latency. Uh, again, uh, what we are trying to do is to avoid the E bands to stay on the lower frequencies so that uh, again. Uh, uh, we're safer. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, it's, everything is, uh, there's no conclusive evidence about uh, uh, higher frequencies being uh, harmful, but we do prefer to work with lower frequencies and to do so you need to uh, provide higher modulation schemes, uh, advanced uh, transportation methods, uh, some innovative approaches. And we're just starting to tap into the surface. There are lots of things that can be done to go to 5G and beyond. And it's quite exciting times. You have super powerful uh, microchips. So they allow computational processes, uh, computational processing, powerful computational processing. And this will allow us to really go to speeds that were unheard of before, like reaching the uh, spectral efficiencies as high as 50 bits per second per hertz per cell. Uh, just to tap on or to go back to what uh, the question was, I think, uh, with regards to the softwares and the, uh, the architecture, there's a new trend today, or not the new uh, uh, cloud technology as well that's emerging, uh, which is well decentralizing the cloud and basically creating several nodes. So, not relying on massive data centers, but rather having nodes distributed next to the uh, or within the 5G base stations. So as to have a grid, uh, a proper data grid. And we're, work, we're working on this, we're embedding this in some of our designs so as to have uh, as a service, not only data, voice, video, but as well computational processing. This would be vital for unmanned vehicles and for series of applications that will be introduced in the near future. Thank you, uh, George. Uh, I'd like to take uh, George Khwairi on. Are you still with us? Presidente. Yes, Assalamu Hi, George. Uh, George is our uh, IT syndicate president. And I want to ask you something about uh, the role of uh, the syndicate today and what's happening. Uh, and what well, is aligned for uh, next week and what's what's going to happen well rudy في عندنا هلا احنا عملنا مثل we created a revival project سميناه Lebanon Revival و هال project هو بمساعده من ربيع كنعان who is with us now present in the group he's helping us uh, to create our شغله we are going to start with a, with an ICT survey to, to know really what's happening. And the guys asked a lot of questions that nobody have answer for it. So uh, we are trying our best. We, I wish we join forces all together and everyone is, uh, is welcome to join us uh, to create an uh, emergency task force uh, to start, first of all, opening new horizon for people to work outside Lebanon, to, to get fresh cash, to get uh, new jobs, and it's working perfectly with the degradation of uh, the, the value of money. Uh, people are getting lots of jobs and uh, we have a big plan. And uh, please, if you care to invite everyone to uh, the starting of the plan next week, the, the 10th of July at 6 p.m. Uh, and to assist us in what we are doing. We hope, we hope that 
together we can do a lot of change. I know that the, the, the general idea and the general vision is very negative, but uh, we have really a lot of positive vibes. And we, are, uh, we, we really think that uh, Lebanon is, is always like a phoenix. It always rises from the ashes. And it will rise more power for this time with the help of, of everyone. Uh, so if we all together assist in this project, uh, I think we can do a lot of difference. Uh, because the main issues is everybody is talking about Lebanon and about the unity of people, but nobody is, uh, is doing it. As an IT sector, we all speak the same language. We all believe that we can make this change. In our business, we don't think about religion. We don't think about politics. We, we don't care about all of these. We care about Lebanon only. And I found this in every person and every uh, organization or association or company in Lebanon. Uh, thanks God that we are really away from all of these attraction, all those negative vibes and all the negative attractions. And we will give, I think, if we succeed, a very good positive uh, lesson to everyone, starting from the politician to the all Lebanese society. Thank you, George. Will George, would you like to introduce uh, next week? Would you like to introduce next week, Evan? Can you can you do it, please? Because uh, you know better about it. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'll be I'll be sharing. Uh, I'll be also sharing uh, uh, the link now. I think uh, we'll be having uh, uh, amazing speakers. We're, we're going to be talking about uh, the economy how we can actually revive uh, the economy. We'll be having three speakers with us. Uh, just one second to, sorry for that. Technology breaks, right? Okay. Uh, sorry. Okay, so we'll be having uh, three speakers, Mr. Roy Badaru, uh, a senior economist, uh, Mr. Gabriel Dick, the president of Internet Society Lebanon, and uh, Mrs. Joanna Abu Jaudi, strategist and consultant. We'll be uh, discussing ICT, ICT sector, the situation, the IT role, the syndicate role, uh, and as a vector for digital economy and knowledge economy growth, because I think the knowledge economy is one of the main pillars in Lebanon. We have a lot of talents, we have a lot of people, there are a lot of uh, uh, jobs, we just need to start uh, implementing and getting more jobs to really support our economy. So uh, with that, I will take Can more I say questions. Something really please? Yes. And uh, as, as Rabia Kinran says that in uh, when Fuad Shaib uh, tried to, to organize and fix our countries 40 years, I don't know, 50 years ago, he, he brought a Belgium company to, to do uh, a study of the market. Uh, so uh, when, when we, when we pre-plan, we will succeed. When we pre-plan and we work based on a plan and that's a very, very powerful strategic plan, we will succeed. And the, 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 we started by uh, analyzing the situation. Then we will get uh, results from that. Then all together, oh, everybody is invited to join. We will put a very positive plan to overpass this, the, those uh, black days. Thank you, Rudy. Uh, thank you, Rabia. I'll start taking the final uh, questions if anybody still wants to uh, ask any, anything. So we can start conclude. And I have reposted the, uh, the round table uh, or actually the syndicate, Lebanese IT syndicate uh, uh, link. So anybody would like to ask a final question before we conclude? Any hands? Any volunteers? All right. I'd like to thank my uh, panelists. Uh, your time was very uh, valuable. And I think this session was uh, highly productive. And hopefully, we were able to bring something new this time again. Uh, see you next week. Next week, uh, I'll be having uh, another talk. But this one, it will be about uh, digital transformation strategies. Uh, so taking things into perspective more. Uh, and on Friday, uh, also at 5 p.m., 
uh, will be having the roundtable uh, about the ICT sector and the revival plan of Lebanon. All right, thank you a lot. Have a great evening and thank you all again. Thank you, Rudy. Bye bye. Thank you, Rudy. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye nice bye. meeting Rudy. you all. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah.